I would be talking about, about serverless, uh, about serverless and in connection with Scala. Well, kind of, at least. So before, uh, before we go to the actual presentation, I wanted to, to set up the expectations about what, are we, what I'm going to talk about. So uh, this is not a very in-depth presentation. Uh, this is not, not also not something that I would like to, it's, it's not like I'm, I'm going to sell you serverless like a, a cure and solution to most of your problems. It's, uh, it's quite opposite. I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't use uh, Lambda or serverless uh, uh, these days with Java for any production code, any production code whatsoever. I mean, you can use it in your, uh, in your pet projects. You may, well, maybe for some production code when you, when you have some kind of a component that is not very important if it fails or when it's slow, you can live with that. That's actually a great, a great idea to use it. But I think that we are on the road. We are heading toward the, the, the direction that five years from now, four years from now, maybe seven years from now, sometime, uh, sometime in the future, serverless would be a much bigger thing, right? And much more important than it is right now. I kind of a think, I see it like uh, the next step of the cloud evolution. So like when we, when we in 2010, when we, I guess the, the, the cloud Amazon started to have some kind of a uh, global, uh, it was used globally, uh, we needed a couple of years. And these days I think most of us, at least, at least most of our projects that we do, for, for many, many companies, they are using uh, Amazon as a default, right? So that's what they deploy software. All right, so let's go to the serverless. And we, when, we, when we think about this word, serverless, it got two parts, server and less, like, right? So it's kind of a, it's, it's like, seems like we have less servers. And I if you think about this as an, uh, an example of the, how serverless looks in a Google, uh, Google data center. It's basically lots of servers, right? So oh, what the heck is with this less? Well, that's the question that I would try to answer at the beginning of the, of the presentation. So the first part would be about wh what are we talking about in general, and then we go to some, some code examples. It's worth to emphasize that serverless is these days like, you know, like uh, microservices four, four years ago or something like that. Everyone is saying serverless on any other conference. You basically can take your, you know, you know, your chart with bullshit bingo and you can you know, put it and you, and, uh, you have agile, serverless, and whatever. Uh, function as a service, things like that. Uh, if you look into the definition, it's actually pretty hard to define. I mean, uh, maybe it's not that pretty hard to define, but there is no single definition. Uh, what the heck does it mean? It's like the same thing happened with DevOps engineering. Uh, can you tell me what is DevOps? Is it a role? Is it a movement? An approach? What is DevOps? Great answer. <laughs> uh, I don't have any swag for you, but uh, if I had, I would give it. I would give it to you. Uh, so, so the thing is that, like with the DevOps, the the original meaning is that the DevOps is the movement, right? How we connect the operation with the development. It's not a role, right? It's not like you are a DevOps engineer, and it means that like, because these days many companies are using DevOps like, okay, you were admin five years ago, so these days you are DevOps because it sounds nicer, right? So you can, you can have a feeling that you improved in your career because the name is better, right? It's not, it's exact, it's, not, it's not that, right? It's like people and the culture in the company or in the team that people who are doing software are also involved with the operation and then and they think about the operation, right? How it affects the production code and things like that. So with the serverless, it's like, if you think about, this is the, de this is the definition I took from the book uh, by Peter Sparsky, who is, uh, I think, CTO in, the, in, the, in a platform, in, a, in an application or a company called Cloud Guru, and they do uh, basically online learning about cloud related things. You may have a courses about, uh, for instance, certification for Amazon. and. Um, if you look at this definition, so we start with the manifestation, blah, 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 intelligent combination. Yeah, we always have intelligent combinations when, it, and it's, uh, when we build software, right? And then we have hosted services, uh, self-managing infrastructure. As I kind of thought that this part may be a little bit more, more important, but when I think about this, it's like hosted services. We're using hosted services for like, I don't know, 10 years or even more. Uh, everything we do in the cloud is related to some kind of a hosted services. And then self-managing infrastructure is 
well, that seems to be another buzzword, right? Well, what does it even mean, self-managing infrastructure, right? It means that well, it wants to, it's, it, it's, it's, it's working on its own, we don't need to do anything. Um, so I, I'm, not really, I'm not really happy with that part, but if we look at the other part, it's like that it, the promises that it will bring the significant improvements in development time and operating costs. Well, that, that is something, right? At least we have a clear goal, like cap down the cost, for either capex or opex. That, that kind of a makes sense. Uh, another, another definition from the same book is moving away from server's infrastructure concerns, so we don't need to think about that, and focus on the code. So this is another thing, because that shows us like, the goal is to minimize or to, to, to optimize, well, basically minimize in this case, the, uh, the uh, both the uh, capital expenditure, so the development cost, and then the operation expenditures that you have when you need to when you need to run your software, and you do that by removing from your uh, while you're developing the software some of the concerns related to hardware and to servers, and you can focus more on the business code that you need to deliver. So, in other words, servers and infrastructures is basically someone else's problem. Okay, so. Uh, because if you think about that, like, I, I think I read that first time in, a, uh, in one of the publications by Neil Ford, uh, he has, I, I don't know that, he, probably he is not the, the first person to use that notions, but you have the complexity while you create software is basically, can be split into essential complexity, and on the other hand, you have the accidental complexity. So the essential is everything that you need to do in order, what, what business pays you for, and the uh, accidental complexity is everything that you need to do anyway, although business ideally wouldn't even would like to pay it for you. So the good example is, for instance, availability. Let, let's take Facebook, right? Facebook has some mission, right? Whatever it is. Well, they display different posts, they display content, they engage people, et cetera, et cetera. The availability is something that they need to have because without that they wouldn't be able to operate, but ideally they would like to forget about that, right? And focus on engaging users, delivering content, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the, the, the kind of a promise of the serverless uh, is that we would be able to focus more on what our business demands us, right? So dem de demands from, uh, from us and from our software. Uh, last slide on that, because if you, if you think on any, any more complicated software with uh, preferably serving like uh, people uh, throughout the world, like many countries, you have tens of thousands of transactions. And if you think uh, with, this, uh, with such a scale, you have so many different problems. And I just I've outlined some of them, right? So you have like stability, performance, reliability. You have things like uh, obviously security, latency, complexity, concurrency, lots of these things. And none of this is related, well, most of the time, none of this is related to business, right? It's not like, like if you talk to the business people, most of this would be like esoteric speech that is completely not un understandable. So the, uh, the serverless tries to help you with some of those problems, right? So those problems are things like availability, scalability, elasticity, which is basically scalability and scaling up and scaling down, right? And distribution and a hardware failure. So in other words, it tries to help you with resilience. Uh, there is one, one good saying from the Werner Vogel, from Werner Vogels, who is the, C the CTO uh, of Amazon Services. And, uh, and he says uh, this, this sentence, which I really like, is that no server is easier to manage than no server at all, right? So uh, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of related to the serverless. And um, let's now go to the, to the characteristics of the serverless. We just discussed the purpose, what's the goal, and the characteristics, what is the, because we have many providers of the serverless services, so let's think what are typical common characteristics. So first of the, this characteristic is that serverless services are stateless. Now, if we think about statelessness, and maybe I should like switch to this part of the room because I don't think that you <laughs> are able to see the screen. Uh, so um, the statelessness, to, to talk about the statelessness, Let's think maybe about what is the conceptual model of the of the lambda of lambda or uh, some serverless uh, function. So at the bottom, you have bare metal, which means server, typical normal server. So this is the 
uh, where you deployed your software 15 years ago. And then there was the cloud appeared, and in case of Amazon, we had EC2, right? The uh, virtualization started to appear and started to be popular, and then when the cloud started to be popular, so 10 years ago, something like that, we had EC2, and uh, so we were able, at that point, we were able to get rid of all the boxes from our company, right? We don't needed to have our private data centers. We still had operating systems, but some were there in the cloud. Someone was taking care of them. Then we had containers, which allowed us to do uh, other fancy things, and uh, among other things, separate different applications and, uh, and, and put basically another level of the, um, uh, another level of, se of separation on the, uh, for instance, on the EC2 instance. And then on top of this, I, I, I put this Lambda function. But think of this, because we are talking about Scala or generally JVM. So think of this like that. We have a sir EC2 instance, and on the EC2 instance, in some container, we have a JVM process, which basically does something, whatever. So this is our Lambda function. Lambda function is JVM process within the container. Uh, if we think about going into this statelessness, if we think about how the typical invocation looks like. So we have uh, this uh, user which tries to invoke our function, and this function may you let's not think about this at this at this point we would go to the concrete examples a little bit later so um, two things may happen one thing is this so uh, the easy route is oh we invoke our function and the function is already bootstrapped is already working so we just pass the control to that function and it does some logic right that's it right so you may think of it like to give you a really tangible example think about like need to be here I don't think I'm seeing anything. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, think about think about a tangible example. Something about like, I mean, at the beginning, like ten years ago or something, you would think about server, the servlet, right? You got a servlet, and the servlet handles requests. So this is your, you could say that this is something like your like your function. It handles some requests, whatever that would whatever this handling would involve. Now, this is easy, but what happens when there is no container? Because our, our JVM process does not exist. So in that case, uh, what, the, uh, what, for instance, Lambda needs to do as a, as a serverless provider on the Amazon is need to start our container because our process is running a container, right? So we need to start our container. Well, before it starts our container, it needs to first find capacity, right? So there is some kind of like a farm of EC2 instances uh, in Amazon and they think, okay, we have some free CPU cycles and uh, we have some free memory on this particular machine. So we can start this container in this place. Then it starts, con then it, uh, starts the container and starts our process. And when our process is started, it can process the, it can handle the request. Now, the problem with this is that it's slow. Because if you think about, well, that's the nature of the JVM, right? The warming up and things like that. Starting JVM process is heavy. So if, if, we, if, we, if we would be talking about JavaScript, that would be pretty, pretty easy and fast. Starting JavaScript is, uh, is, very, is very fast. It's not the case with, the, uh, with, the JV, uh, with, uh, with Java. So let's go a little bit deeper into this because this would, this would kind of uh, uh, allow us to understand the statelessness. So because it's not really the case that always when there is started container, we would always just invoke uh, our Lambda and that would be, that would be it. Now, there may be a couple of different uh, situations. First of all, we could have our lambda at some point, and then it stopped, uh, and then it's uh, uh, not there anymore. What could happen? Well, it, it might have failed, right? So that's what, what happens with our applications in the cloud when we have like 100 servers and uh, they run some services. Failure is daily bread and butter, right? When you have one server, probably it may run without failure for some time. When we have like hundreds of thousands of different services, they will fail on a daily basis. So uh, this, is, this is what can happen. It, can, it, can, it, can, it could fail, so it's, it's, it's not there anymore. Or maybe our container which runs our process because it handles so many requests, but it doesn't, it doesn't have anymore any CPU cycles, or maybe we exhausted all the RAM memory that we had. In this case, uh, our serverless provider needs to find another, well, needs to, again, do the same thing as at the beginning, find the EC2 instance when there is free capacity, put there our container and start it up, right? So we have, uh, think about this at the moment because now what we are talking about is that we just have 
scaling up out of the box, right? Uh, actually, it's scaling out in this case. Uh, but anyway, uh, the thing is that we can on the fly get additional capaci uh, capacity. And, uh, and last but not least, there may be any other reason because, you know, that's a provider. They have different strategies, so they may do some optimization and things like that. The point is, we shouldn't really be concerned about this. That's the role of the provider. Find the capacity and make sure that our request will be handled. Now, if, we th if, you, if you think about the reasons uh, why the container could be removed, well, I said about one reason uh, that it could fail, but it also may happen that it is not used for quite some time. So I told you about scaling out. So you have like a, a trade peak in e-commerce, Black Friday or Cyber Monday. You have many customers buying online. What you need in this case, you have uh, much more uh, transactions than usually. So what you need to do is to, you need to scale out, handle all the traffic, perhaps with the capacity being three times the normal capacity. And then when the traffic goes out and we have regular number of people, uh, customers, we don't need three times the capacity. We just need to scale down, right? Remove the instances which are not being used. So this is what can happen here, scaling down. Uh, and that would be, again, done automatically. If our provider, in this case, uh, Lambda, uh, uh, AWS Lambda figures out the, that we don't need, for instance, four different containers, it can just, uh, it just, just kill some of them. So the conclusion from the statelessness is this. The state in your single process, because we are thinking about JVM process, well, you can have some caching. You can have your hash maps or whatever you put there, right, in, this, in your process, but just keep in mind, that it might evaporate at any given point in time. So at any given point in time, your container might be killed. And another one might be started. But then again, if you think about microservice architecture, that isn't there that much of a difference there, right? We, the, the ideal case in microservices that we could, if we could treat all our uh, services are, state, uh, are stateless. That's ideal, right? And that's like kind of a, uh, it's not always possible, but if it is possible, that's the way to go. And the other character characteristic is event-driven. So basically, our functions are, are run or initiated by, by some kind of an event. I don't want to talk about each and every of them, but perhaps the interesting thing is that you can directly invoke uh, your Lambda code, which basically, you basically allows you to, do, to run it from anywhere. Or you can use some services uh, and pre-configured uh, events that will, uh, that will start the, uh, the processing in our Lambda. So these events may be something like API Gateway, which, ha which handles HTTP traffic, REST like uh, uh, API. It may be simple notification service, SNS or Kinesis, so basically messaging queues. Or it may be simple uh, storage service, right? Which is S3, which is basically for storing your file and for, for simplification. So you may have some kind of a logic that performs. The, the classical example is when you have the application when you need to uh, create, you have users and you want to have, like in Facebook, you want to have uh, photos of user in different, scaled to different elements of the screen. So on the profile page, you have big picture. On the menu bar, you have small picture, right? So what you do basically is you need to scale this picture to a couple of different resolutions. So what you can do is uh, like put the normal uh, picture in S3 and just configure uh, some kind of an event that will fire some kind of a lambda that would do the scaling for you and write those. When, when those images would be ready, it would write it to some predefined location. And last but not least, interesting thing is, for instance, you may even use it as a backend for your Alexa. For those of you who don't know is what is Alexa, is, is voice uh, interface from Amazon, so it's like Google Home, right? Uh, and the last, last characteristic is that Lambda is basically compute code. So what it does is basically runs your logic. I told you at the beginning about the process. So we have JVM process. It does, it does whatever you put, the logic, whatever, whichever you put there, but it's the all what it, what it does, right? If you want to store some values and things like that, you use other services, right? Like databases in Amazon or, or, or whatever. So, uh, ah, damn it. Oh, but this slide was optional. That's why I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last thing uh, in this part is that. Oh, you. Okay, ask.
Right. So I think there are two, two, basically, as I understand it, there are two questions within this single question. One is, that's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong. One is, like, can my code do something like uh, invoke some other logic, right, some other services? And the second question, which I, which I implicitly understood, I, you were not asking about this explicitly, can my Lambda be invoked on its own without some kind of an event? All right, so the, 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 second, the first option is very simple, right? You can do whatever logic you want to do that. So, I mean, I, mean, I don't know, down, download photos of kitten if you want from some service, right? So uh, it, uh, sure. Well, uh, that's the kind of a, I didn't go too far into this presentation, into these areas, because I'm not really, uh, I'm not really a big fan of this approach to, to, to its, uh, to its, you know, uh, maximum extent. But there are many people that advocate that when you use lambda, you should compose to the maximal level. So, like, some of those people say that, you know, when you have REST API, for instance, and uh, you have these resources, and you perform some actions that each combination of action and resource is a separate lambda, for instance. That would make uh, like every other application, every application that you can create in a couple of months probably decompose, I don't know, 200 of different lambdas, right? I am not, th th the reason why I'm not, not talking about this is because I, I am not sure about this. I think at the end of the day, we would end up with some kind of a mess and you would need to find a way, another level to manage all your lambdas. I, I will show some examples how I approach that. Uh, uh, later, but the answer, straightforward answer is yes, it is composable. And it, that's the nature of it, that it should be composable. Right, so uh, that's an involved question because <laughs> if, we, if we touch this subject of long running trans, because at the end of the day we are talking about some sequence of steps. I mean, what you do in your normal application when you have sequence of steps which require, for instance, four minutes or I don't know, 30 seconds of some, some communication and processing and your server fails after 10 seconds? That's the complex question because the answer is, I mean, it depends, right? What are, the, what are the things? Are they transactional? Are there, you need to revert something on the different services? It's like, but this is not really something that would be, because uh, I said about that, Lambda can disappear, yes. But the same goes for your uh, microservice, right? It can also disappear. That's the nature of the microservices. You have like five of them, five of instances in your, uh, in your cluster, for instance, and well, some of them will die at some point in time, right? That's failure happens. So uh, the, the other, because the other question was about the, I'm going back to some slides. Think about this, like this Lambda function, as I said, is your JVM process. I mean, you can put whatever you want there. There's no some, uh, there is no some restrictions about what you can, yeah, what can, you can put there. In case, because I would be talking later about a couple of different providers, if we are talking about OpenWhisk, which is the, uh, from the IBM, they basically give you a Docker container and you can run, I mean, you can run whatever you want, C, Java, whatever. So there's no restrictions what, you, what your logic would do. Uh, okay, let's get back to this, because that's, that, that's the important distinction. In, in a serverless, you pay for the execution. So it means, uh, actually it's, uh, it's execution, it's number of requests plus the uh, amount of uh, gigabyte seconds, which means that if your uh, Lambda requires one gigabyte to execute and you execute it for one second, you just use one gigabyte second, right? So uh, 
And the thing is, you don't have pricing here, but it's not really important. The important thing is to looking uh, into the perspective that if we have per single request, because in Lambda you define the, the amount of memory that you can use, if you use uh, 400 mem nearly 400 megabytes of memory for single request, that's a lot, right, for single request. Normally we, we can have a server with a couple of gigabytes of RAM and it would handle uh, hundreds of at least tens of requests uh, uh, simultaneously, right? So for single request, 400 megabytes and average execution time, one second, again, pretty long, right? One second is, well, who would wait these days on, uh, for your server to respond in one second? Uh, you would need to have 10 millions of uh, requests every month to start paying a single, well, actually $50, right? But if you have only 1 million, not 10 millions, you would pay nothing because well, that's the free tier that is, that, is, uh, that is for Lambda. Obviously, when you use like database, you use some kind of other services, you would pay for them services as you usually, usually do. Some of them have free tiers, some of them don't, right? That depends on the service. Uh, to give you some kind of a, a comparison, to put this into perspective, 10 millions of requests, and if we take 38th uh, page on the Alexa ranking, so web popularity ranking in, in November 2016, Imager had 45 millions of image uploads every month. So it's like, so it's similar numbers. Obviously they are doing lots of, lots of, lots of other things, but the point I'm trying to tell you that here is that if you think about your site project or small project that is not very important in your even production environment, something that's not critical, then for most of the time you would be able to, to run it for pennies. So uh, the, the thing is this, uh, first of all, this is something, um, it depends, because I would need to go a couple of slides uh, back the, because we have this uh, different services that can run your Lambda. I think that most typical one, what is more classic one is that we have a web application, which means that we have REST calls done from JavaScript, right? That's the typical thing. So what you do, you block the DDoS attacks and things like that. You can do that on the HTTP gateway. In other cases, like when you have other services, I mean, oh, that's the security thing, right? So you would need to keep in mind security, for instance, for SNS messages and things like that. So Amazon is pretty rich when it comes to security configuration. That's something important because, well, yeah, it may happen, right? That, that if you do something uh, uh, in a way that is, uh, uh, that is not secured, someone would, would may break into your system and invoke some of your functions, for instance. But then, then again, if someone would, what would happen, like what would happen with your, I guess in your normal application, if someone would do DDoS, he would just succeed, meaning he would crash your application. Now you need to think, you can do that on the HT, uh, HTTP uh, API gateway. That's the level when you put, uh, where, where you put this thing. Um, back to even driven, oh, I think I will skip that because that's too, de uh, too, too much of the details. So the, the question about why now? Because if you think about the history, 2008, and we had Google App Engine, that's 10 years, 10 years ago, and that was uh, exactly the thing, right? So we could have, code without thinking about code, run without thinking about servers, infrastructure, and things like that. Uh, There's probably a couple of different reasons. And uh, one of, uh, I think I, I, I th see three, uh, three reasons, right? Three main reasons why now. One of these reasons is knowledge and understanding in the uh, kind of a mindset of the industry. So these days we are all talking about the monoliths and about the microservices. And it just turns down, uh, turn, turn, uh, turns out that all those rules that are related, or, or most of these rules that are related to microservices, and this is taken from Netflix, lesson learned from architectural design from microservices, many of these lessons are really, really the same or very similar with the successful implementation of the Lambda. So you can think of like, well, one way of thinking is, is trying to, there's the word for it, commoditize, right, make, make a, commu a commodity. Commoditization of uh, 
uh, microservice infrastructure, right? Something like that. So deploying containers, well, we have a deployment in containers uh, with Lambda. Treat servers as stateless, that's, that's again the same. So that's, that's how, when we talk about microservices, there, these are the lessons that, that the successful deployments uh, had. Another thing is technology. So, right, we, we needed a couple of years to go to this, to this point where we are. So first containers, I think, maybe there was something uh, something before that, but really that what they hit the, the, the market was uh, open uh, virtuoso parallels and then we have WPARs in 2007, so it's 10 years ago, right? And Docker started to be, I don't know, that's five years ago or something like that when, when Docker really appeared on the, on the market. And the last thing is, and that, that is, I think that is one of the very important thing. Uh, when we talk about Google App Engine, you had this, I don't know how many of you remembers that, but at that point in time, these days we have uh, in many different services on Google, and that time we had, I think, one database, which 10 years ago was pretty awkward, right? I think it was column-based uh, database. I don't remember what was the, the name for that uh, in, uh, for Google, but that was really something that was at that time awkward. You really needed to think about, you know, all the Google infrastructure because that was really specific. And if you think about the services these days, like these are the up updates and new announcement about the services uh, in Amazon. So you can take a look at that in, in, in only in 2013, the, they have more announcements about the new services and updates in existing services than in for these years here, right? So the number, like these days you know, on Amazon you can have API gateway, messaging queue, all the kinds of databases that you may want, right? And, and, and lots of these things. There are probably there are hundreds of them these days. Uh, also, the, the important thing is network speed, right? So the, the network speed, and again, uh, approach how we, do, how we do things, right? So in 2000, the all the world was about the 2005, J2E, and SOAP, I guess. Uh, maybe not Corba anymore, but still SOAP. So, uh, we had networks and, and a data center that will like take 10 gigabytes. So uh, comparing to that, these days we have like 25, 50 gigabytes networks are pretty typical in many data centers. That's one thing. And if you think about, well, we don't use XMLs anymore. We use JSON for some time. For some time. Now we use what, protobuf, things like that, binary protocols that are far more efficient than XMLs that were 10 years ago. So it boils down to the fact that 10 or 15 years ago, or even 10 years ago when, when, uh, when we started with Google App Engine, what we typically do is even when we have SOA, service-oriented architecture, we could bounce on the server from, I don't know, on three, four different servers, and then it started to take too long to, to, you know, for the users to wait. These days we can process 10, 20 times more. So it's not very strange that when, when, when we go to the server, actually what happens on the server side is that our requests bounce uh, through, I don't know, 10, 20 different microservices or even more. Uh, what serverless is not? Well, serverless is not a function, uh, well, that is some, like some people call it, function as a service. But it really goes to the, to the question that you asked uh, uh, about the composition. I think that kind of a puts the emphasis on the wrong thing. It's like trying to suggest to you that, well, you have, you can have like services as a function, What's, what would be next? Variables as a function, that's actually what it was, was one of my colleagues is saying, right? He's laughing from the server lessons and saying that's, that's ridiculous because wh wh where would we go next from there, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so um, uh, I don't think that's, the, that's, the, that's really the point in here, although that's, that's pretty deceiving. Uh, I think that the, that the point here is that we can uh, forget about the concerns related to infrastructure. And to just to give you the reference, like uh, there are at least four different four different provider four different providers uh, that could do that do serverless services. Uh, the most popular one is the Amazon, so it's compared to the to, to, to the other ones. And I think we can start to build something finally because uh, I hope that you have some understanding what is the goal and what is the the promise of the serverless. So let's start with simple example, and this simple example would be using. Well, these asterisks here mean something like that. No sane person would ever do it like this. So keep that in mind. But it will, I will try to show it with you. Uh, I, I use these examples because 
I think that maybe they will show you what is in what is involved in the, in the whole process, and then we'll then we'll go to the to the see some uh, better solutions. So uh, here is some simple example, and what I need to do is there is some uh, some jar on the for Lambda from Amazon, and there's a bunch of interfaces. What this interfaces uh, uh, defines is this is this handle request method. It takes a couple of parameters, obviously input, output, and context. So well, uh, everything that may be useful for execution, you always put in context, right? So that's the old trick. So that, that's the same what they did, did here. And uh, here you can see the, um, uh, some, some example, right? We can get from context logger. We can get from context, for instance, the uh, number of milliseconds that we still have to our, our lambda would be killed because we specify for our Lambda the maximum time of execution. So it's like if we specify that our Lambda can execute for three seconds, when it's not finished after three seconds, it will be killed, right? So you can specify different, I, I think that the maximum amount is six minutes, something like that. Uh, so, and here is how we write the result. Nothing really fancy. So it looks like we have some kind of a request and then we would write the uh, date and the ID of the request. That's it. Now. This is our code. What do we need to do to make this code working? So we need to do deploy it on Lambda. So how many of you are uh, is using uh, AWS in your work? 40%, uh, 40%, right. So we would, you would probably know about, uh, about all those things because th these are pretty fundamental uh, things. So one thing that we need to do is we need to create Uber jar. So jar which is contains all the libraries and all the jars that, that our code depends on and then we need to push our uber jar into s3 so then we need to uh, assign a policy to our we need to create a role and we need to assign a policy because as i said uh, amazon is taking security at least tries to take security seriously so every service and uh, all that you do in amazon is pretty often related to the, to the uh, at least connected somehow to, to security. Uh, we need to have a policy that would allow our Lambda to write into CloudWatch because otherwise, remember, we don't have a server. It will do logs where those logs would, would go, right? We need to, they, they normally go to CloudWatch. And uh, we need to have a policy that allows our, our Lambda to write into this CloudWatch. And our function would assume this role uh, and when our function uh, is started, it will grab the code from here and it would run it in a, in a container. So first step, we need to have, a, we need to have Uber, we, not, we got Uber jar and we need to push it to S3. So first of all, we need to create a Uber jar. How do we do it in Scala? Well, we can use, uh, you can, we can use one of the uh, uh, SBT plugins, SBT assembly, and we can add it to our SBT build. Uh, and then we can, we need to have these dependencies. So these are these uh, interfaces that I mentioned in the beginning. And when we, well, obviously we need to do some strategies related to, to how this, uh, related to this plugin, how basically those jars would be merged. It's nothing really complicated. And when we, uh, when we create uh, the, when we run the goal assembly, the, the target, then we would, uh, the, the single jar would be created. And then what we need to do is to use Amazon CLI to push it to our S3 bucket. Well, first we create the bucket, then we push the jar there. Then we need to create our policy. And at this point, I would stop explaining what I'm doing because that's not really important. Who would remember that? So I need to do a bunch of stuff, right? A bunch of different things. Then I need to do more different things and more different things. And uh, then I have my function. I need to do surprisingly more different things. And then uh, that's important, probably important or interesting because I mentioned about the timeout. So there are at least three things that are, well, some of these parameters are maybe more, more interesting than others. First is timeout. So we can specify how much time our Lambda would, uh, would execute. After this time, it, uh, its execution would be stopped. We uh, specify the maximum amount of memory, which means that if we exceed this, we, if, if processing single request exceeds this memory, then the Lambda would be killed. And uh, then we need to specify which is the function that would handle our code. So this is the function that I that I specified in my in my class. So this would. Yeah. Like 
No, uh, wait a moment. No, no. So uh, the thing is this: that uh, that's actually a good question. I didn't think about that because uh, I f I've seen it this couple of times. But the thing is here: well, I would know that if I could to take a look at how the uh, how the uh, what is the memory profile of that. But obviously, I cannot do that easily. Interesting. Well, I need to think about that. Let me let me have a beer and then maybe something come will come to my mind. Yes. Actually not. It it also it also uses the it also takes into account starting. So that's a tricky thing. I will talk talk about this at the at the end because okay. startup oh. It's, it's being recorded, but I can I can tell you this probably that starting up JVM is uh, it's a I mean that's a really really messy problem, right? Because starting JVM takes time, a lot of time. I mean you cannot really afford starting JVM when your requests are trying to reach your application because it will take like 10, 15 seconds. It's too much. You would start getting timeouts all over the place, right? So because then it would perhaps invoke other lambdas, and if two of them needs to be started, it would need to wait half a minute. That's not feasible. I, I would talk about that in the, at the beginning, but there are because there are ways, right, to, to, to work around this. And <coughs> okay, these were so so this is probably interesting, and these two are interesting parameters. So uh, more configuration, not really important, but this at this point where we are is that we can actually invoke our lambda. So that is something because we just put some configuration, use CLI to put everything into the server and we use the simple CLI which uses this function name uh, and, it, it, and it writes the output here. And as you can see, input, there is no input from this invocation, fetched with ID, right, this is the ID. And at the, so this is exactly the code that I have here, right? So uh, this is this, right? So we could invoke something, but, but, but let's, let's, let's go further a little bit with this. Client call. How do we do client calls with the native inter interfaces from the, uh, from the Amazon? Bear in mind that what Amazon prepared is basically just for usage for Java. So everything here is like Java uh, wrapped within some kind of a Scala code. So we prepare an interface. Interesting part is here that I don't have a parameter here. I do have here event means async. So we can either do synchronous call or asynchronous call. And how do, I, how do I invoke this? Well, I need to create from this interface, I need to create concrete class. And then when I have this stub, I can invoke it. Hello, so this was uh, this guy. And hello async, is this the, the other guy? And in this case, we would see that it returns null because there is, there is no, uh, well, there is no response. It just called asynchronously. In this case, we would, we would have the result return value that we had on the server. Uh, and we can see it here, right? So input sync call, and we have this, this result. Here, there is no result at all. Now, when you want to have REST, you need to do even more configuration. And this configuration is, uh, man, that's, it starts to be complicated, right? Because we need to add API gateway and other permissions. We need to specify some kind of an interface that would, or, or the case class in that case that would, uh, that would handle, that, I mean, we don't need to do that. But if we do that, we specify such a class with such a case class with such a structure, it would work out of the box. We don't, we won't need to configure anything on API gateway. So that's, that makes things a little bit easier. And how does it look like? Well, in this case, uh, what we have here is the same interface and we build this response and uh, we put something into the body and we write it again as, uh, as in the, as the previous example. More configuration to have API gateway. It's not even fixing the screen here. And all this configuration, all that is here, created just this. A single resource that would, uh, that would be, that could reply to any method that we use, post, get, whatever, right? That's, well, that's why it's, there is any. Okay, so that doesn't really make things easier, right? We need to, we have our, ser we have like servers that could, or infrastructure that could run our code, but we need to do lots of configuration for very simple thing, right? So imagine normal application. So there are some ways. 
some of one of the uh, one of the help that could uh, the could be taken from, for instance, for a serverless uh, framework, and that's a bunch of a uh, bunch of scripts, and basically that's all. That's also a framework for many languages. It's uh, actually it's it's written in the style of JavaScript, Node.js, things like that, but uh, it also handles uh, uh, Java. I think it even it may even handle .NET or something like that. Although development experience would be really like with JavaScript and Node uh, Node applications. Interesting thing is that it that it handles all all those providers. So though, for instance, Azure and Google only only um, only uh, provides JavaScript. So in this this cases, you wouldn't be able to, to deploy Java code. Uh, so how would we look with uh, with the serverless? You have a descriptor, a descriptor which is serverless YAML, and all these parameters that I showed you, uh, you would basically do like my provider is AWS because serverless can app, uh, that's actually that's pre pretty uh, misleading that the framework is called serverless, right? <laughs> because it's, it's, it's the same as the as the as the whole idea. So that makes things a little bit complicated, more complicated. And then what we define here is is basically our HTTP uh, API gateway. So our handler and what is the path and what is the method that would be invoked. And we have a class that's that's Java code because it's it's, it's it supports only only Java. It doesn't support Scala easily. Uh, and then we just do serverless deploy, and that's important. That's interesting, maybe, but not necessarily important because if you take a look here, you have like a couple of different things. Uh, stacks are this basically related to cloud formation, which I will be talking in a, in a minute. But it's it generated probably some kind of a jar because it's uploading this to S3, then it's checking something, and at the end it says that, okay, your aim point is here. And the best thing is, it's deployed here. You just take this thing, put it into a browser, and it works. So like you create this and this, and run one command, that's it. So there is also another alternative, uh, Chalice, which is for Python. Uh, it's, it's developed by, uh, uh, by Amazon themselves. So uh, uh, it looks, uh, it's in Python, so it's probably not that interesting, but the, the thing here is that we can define with some kind of an annotation on however it's called in Python, what is the root, and what is the logic, and then we do chalice deploy, and again, we have this thing deployed, we can invoke it right away. Pretty simple. And now we go to the main point, so Quake. Uh, and Quake is something that was the work started by uh, two folks, I think Brendan Mike Adams was the one guy, and the other was the guy, oh, I forgot his name. Anyhow, so they started the work, and I, uh, and I at some point picked it up and continued the work uh, on the serverless framework, uh, on the on the Quake framework, which is the kind of a serverless framework for Scala. And mm, Quake basically, it's 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 pronounced Quake. And for you, for some of you who, who may be interested, what what the hell is Quake? Quake is this vessel. Th this vessel is used for drinking whiskey, and it's uh, I think some old Scottish vessel. So. The name comes from the fact that it was, uh, that was uh, basically a chalice was uh, something that they, uh, that was the, uh, they, they brought the, the chalice brought the idea of this, uh, how we could do this in, in Scala. So uh, simple lambda qu uh, with Quake. So all that we did in a, just a moment ago, all this configuration and all those things would, be, would look like this. We just asked as SBT plugin and then all these things that are here, you would just put a couple of configura configurations and uh, parameters in SBT. So S3 bucket, because we need to have S3 buckets, uh, lambda name, uh, role that we would use, right? So here, uh, region that we want to deploy, timeout, so everything that, that I was talking uh, a couple of minutes ago. And as I really wanted to you know, optimize for the developer experience, so what is, uh, basically it, you can use a flag which is created automatically and in this case, you mean, okay, I am using this Lambda for my test purposes or my pet project or whatever. So I, would, I can specify these parameters, but I don't want to configure all those stuff. Just, it means if you use create, uh, if, you, if you put this create automatically, it would create everything for you. So like Lambda role, function configuration, S3, everything. Obviously in a production environment, Developer probably wouldn't have access to production configuration, and there would be some kind of other people related to security, and all those things would be more complicated. But 
uh, in certain, in certain uh, like, uh, my, my kind of goal is that if you want to do something simple, it should be as simple as possible. If you want to do something complicated, you just turn the switch off and you can do everything manually. Your choice. So uh, you put those parameters, create automatically in my case, you need to specify, this is the only, I think, required parameter because you need to specify region, right, where you want to deploy, right? Uh, would it, should it be data center in, uh, in Europe, in Ireland, on, uh, in, in Germany, or in the United States, whatever. And uh, I put those values, so 30 seconds and 192 megabytes of memory limits, but I could use the default. And after that, uh, I put my, uh, my code, which is basically this. So again, I'm just writing some JSON out. And I'm using the target SBT, blo the SBT deploy lambda. So I'm doing SBT deploy, uh, SBT my project deploy lambda. And what it would do first, it would create Uber jar. Then uh, it's here, it's packaging. You see assembly because it's used the same plugin as, uh, as in the, the example SBT assembly. Then it would figure out what is the, uh, what is the lambda. So I don't need to uh, define it because I put this annotation here. So it would figure out that my handler is, uh, is here. Then it would uh, figure out that the role, plain and simple, I didn't put the role in the configuration. So here, there's no information about the role. So what it figures out is that it's the name of the Lambda. If it's there, use it. If it's not there, create it. So it creates the role. Then it creates the policy. Then uh, attaches the policy. If the bucket doesn't exist, it would create the bucket. It would upload our code. And at the end, well, we are basically done. And when we do the second run, it would figure out that uh, the role has been found, so nothing needs to be done. The bucket is already there and is accessible. We have rights to write there. Uh, we obviously need to, when we change code, we need to upload our jar again. So that's the mandatory step. Uh, we, and we need to update our function because we are pointing again to, uh, to our new jar. Uh, we, uh, well, that's basically it again, right? Because we reuse what could be reused and our, our uh, Lambda has been updated, and that's it. So now after this, so we have this piece of code, this piece of uh, SBT, and we use this SBT deploy Lambda, and after this, we can directly involve it from CLI. So the thing is, if you have a repository with the SBT Lambda sample, like for instance, my repository with the sample, you would obviously need to create uh, a couple of different methods how you can authenticate with your AWS account, but one of them is putting uh, your credentials things in your environment via variable, for instance. When you do that, you can basically, in, depending on your network speed, you can in two minutes have a running code on the server which you can invoke. So uh, this is some um, example, but I will skip that. I don't think that it's very important and it's already getting, getting late. The important, may maybe interesting thing, not important again, is that I said about this statelessness and that you need to remember that some of these your code may, your Lambda may be destroyed at any point in time and another instance would be created. Well, if that's the case, uh, it actually means that you can keep your state. So if you can keep your state, you can even your Lambda create, as I, as I created here, you can, I, I, I don't want to explain this example. That's my, they were my experimentation with typed uh, ACCA actors. Uh, but the thing is, in your Lambda, there's nothing stopping you from creating ACCA system and handling all your requests with ACCA if you want to, right? That's entirely, uh, entirely uh, up to you. Just you need to keep in mind that it may be destroyed. When the, when the, when the next Lambda would be created, your ACCA system would need to be recreated, but that's, that's nothing new. Uh, okay, so uh, example with HTTP. For HTTP, uh, there is uh, another, uh, another plugin that I created that, that handles API, API Gateway. And we need to enable this plugin. And then this is our code. So this uh, uh, DSL is saying that for post and for post method on pink resource, perform this. For uh, get method on pink resource, so here we have post, here we, ha here we have get, perform, uh, execute this. And with this, we can do deploy HTTP API, and it would do all the stuff that we needed to create manually, and it will create all the endpoints and everything, and at the end, it will start tell us, okay, well, your application is there. So again, if you think about what do you need to have to create web application, well, you need to have a bunch of uh, resources for front end, which is uh, HTML, JS, CSS, things like that. You put everything there in, uh, in S3. Uh, you need to have logic, Somewhere. So you create your Lambda, which handles your REST API calls. And 
uh, you can now connect the dots. You have basically running application uh, without thinking about server and without even paying for it a, a single penny, probably if you created it for your own, like uh, as, as a pet project or something. So my, my typical example is like Slack book, uh, Slack bot, because uh, who of you is, is using Slack in your work? Oh, basically everyone, nearly everyone. So I guess that at least some of you had an idea it would be nice to create some kind of a bot or some kind of an application that could do something. My uh, idea was, uh, Maybe we should have an application that would just uh, show us from, we are ordering food from mostly the same places and they are publishing the menu on the Facebook. So maybe this bot could just go every day to this Facebook page and just put to Slack what they have <laughs> for the menu and people would just say, okay, I wanted this, I wanted this, I wanted this, end of story, right? And at the end it would rise some kind of an alarm and someone would order the food. So these days, like if you have this thing is the simplest example of the Slack, uh, Slack application. So basically when you do this command uh, or slash quite pink, it will reply, uh, it works and it will use my login name. So it, it, it in, in, inferred my login name from somewhere. And this somewhere is actually here because the example what I show, which I shown was basically a Slack bot uh, implementation, right? So for get, it was only for me for testing. Slack is sending post uh, for this pink uh, resource, and I get from the uh, from the uh, from the request from the body. I get actually my user handle because my user handle from the from Slack because Slack passes this to me, and I print I return this value which is exactly printed here. I mean you can have the simplest Slack boots in two minutes. Right? You just get this get this example, run it, and deploy it on your on your Lambda, and you can just modify it whatever you want. Uh, you know, start to get probably the idea that with this with the DSL you can create whatever you want here, right? So you can, you can have, that's, we just run the full, full circle to your question, like at the, somewhere at the beginning or in the middle, that how should we approach, how should we compose? I am not really a fan of having single Lambda for single, uh, for single uh, REST resource and method. What I would do, I would do probably the same as with microservice. I would rather use the domain yeah, maybe single com controller. I would like to say single domain concern, something like that, whether there would be single controllers, like or a bunch of them, doesn't really matter. But um, I would put like, if we had something related to user interaction, I would put it in, a, in, a sing in one Lambda, I would, I would have another logic related to, uh, I don't know, some photos or some uh, things related to purchase order, I would put it to another, so because that's another domain concern. Uh, all right, I mean, I think I I'm already talking too much at this point, so and it's already pretty late. Uh, for those of you who don't know CloudFormation, I am using this behind the scene. CloudFormation is a really nice product. It has its problems, but the general idea of CloudFormation is that you have all those services, like, and I if, we, if we go to the examples that I had, so even the simple Lambda, usually requires a couple, couple of different uh, cloud services like CloudWatch, uh, some uh, Lambda, S3, some roles. Uh, normally you would use database, maybe messaging queue, uh, Cognito for authentication. So you can configure every th uh, all of this in your, uh, with the use of CloudFormation and basically use your infrastructure as a code because that's the name and then by the way, again, another uh, buzzword. You can use either JSON or, or YAML, I think to specify that I want to have this Lambda, this role, I want to have this database, and you just deploy the whole stack as a, as a, as a descriptor and AWS would create everything for you. And if you look here, this is exactly what I used for creating API Gateway. I created a stack uh, and this stack of stack sync finished. So I created the stack which created all these things, right? So Lambda, API Gateway, and all, all those different different things related to it, right? Uh, but that's a, that's a kind of a bonus. I don't think I have any more, except that uh, I think that, let me emphasize this again, I said it at the beginning, I don't think that is something that you could use uh, for production, or at least not for something that would be really critical. 
but I always had problems when I wanted to have something, my own application to, to do something even within company. I need to find a server, I need to deploy it, and I need to keep all this stuff together. I need to start to be, you know, start DevOps engineering because like these days is a little bit easier, right? Because you can have some kind of a Travis build which would deploy everything somewhere to Heroku, but it's, you would still need to pay something for this, right? And you can really build something that even for the medium scale would work without, you know, paying a penny and without thinking about all those servers and all those things. You would just do everything from your SDK. That's what, that was basically my point when I started working on, uh, on, on Quake. Or actually, I didn't start working. I just continued the work that was started by Brandon McAdam. Uh, questions? I expected this. Uh, single uh, runtime with a couple of libraries. The, the example that I had, we had like three libraries, I don't know if you remember, like three or four libraries. It was JSON processing and, and two jars with interfaces and obviously Scala runtime was 18 megabytes, I think. Something like that. So it's pretty much the reason that we're still seeing slight issues with yeah. Rust. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one thing, right? So the one thing is normally that is, but most of this is uh, is actually Scala runtime. There is a way out of this of this problem, and I don't have it on my slides. But what you would need to do is uh, there is this thing called yeah, kind of a true shaker. There is this uh, for SBT. It's god damn it, I forgot the name. I had it in my sample slides, uh, in my optional slides somewhere. I just covered them. Yes, yes, for Android, there is this, 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 this library that basically figures out what you are using and basically cuts down everything else, right? ProGuard, right, it's ProGuard. Yeah, exactly, it's ProGuard. You can use ProGuard. Uh, I started to do some work with that. It's not that, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit tricky, but, well, I mean, people are using successfully this successfully for Android. This works, right? So. You need to really from 20 megabytes for perhaps normal application would go to a couple of megabytes at the most. But the problem is still there, right? Because I mean, let's be honest, every other appli every application that we write these days is like you know, tw 200 megabytes or something. Who of us ever thinks about putting another jar into the, even if we talk about microservices, there might be, I don't know, a couple of thousands of lines of code, but we usually have some dependencies. So. Uh, when you prepare open source uh, or running our hobby projects, is it something for something? S, S3 is quite free. No, S3 is, uh, see, uh, the, no, the, the, limit, the limit that was mentioned is that these days, the limit for uh, Lambda and AWS is I think 15 megabytes or something like that. But I think they were to extend limit to like 200 megabytes and they said that the general limit is temporary. Because, I mean, if you want to have like the big application uh, production ready at some point, because that, that's the ultimate goal, right? So that people would be able to write in, in Java production applications there. This limit would need to be removed, right? There's no other way around it. Java is heavy in terms of uh, disk spaces. I mean, relatively heavy comparing to JavaScript, right? Because, yeah, yes, yes, yes. but we don't really uh, care about JVM because JVM is not counted towards our limit. We care about Scala runtime, that's, that's the thing. There wouldn't be the problem, for instance, for Kotlin, right? But because for Kotlin, we have a runtime which is like, I don't know, two, five, four megabytes, something like that, right? Yeah, but not important. Uh, for us, uh, for us, maybe like 20% or more of like code. Yeah. Utilizing Java as stuff. Oh, and one thing, because I don't want to be uh, understood wrong here. When I'm saying that it's not production ready and I wouldn't use it for, for production, I'm talking about Java. 
because for JavaScript, there are actually big production, uh, production applications that are running on this. There is this guy com, uh, called uh, Jan Kui, I think, that says his handle Twitter is burning monk, and he's doing great work and about uh, in, uh, in serverless space, but he's using JavaScript mostly. And they have, I think, a couple of games, some projects that are with huge uh, base of customers, and they are running everything serverless. The same is for Cloud Guru. Cloud Guru is, this, uh, uh, is the mm, uh, learning online learning platform. And they have tens of thousands of, of people using this, right? But they are using JavaScript. That's the distinction. Oh, there was not such a question, but I told that I mentioned at the, at the end uh, the problem of the warm up. Java starts slowly, and it's unfeasible to use Java if you if you need to if you if you hit this uh, uh, the container which is not being started, you would need 15 seconds or something like that. What you do in that case is, and one of these slides there was the diagram that uh, I showed you the CloudWatch service. CloudWatch service basically, in my example, was used to keeping logs. So you can keep logs. It can give you some reports about some different things and also can run scheduled. So think about this. Lambda is when you are using Lambda, you are being charged for the execution, which means that if your Lambda, you deploy your Lambda and you, you are using it once a day for one second, for 30 days in a month, you would be charged for 30 seconds. Now, if you, uh, Lambda is being, your container is being decommissioned after 10 minutes of, uh, of inactivity. So what you do, you just run a scheduler that every nine minutes sends a dummy message. Yeah, it sets pings every, a ping every nine minutes. Funny thing is that because some people tell us that, okay, at some point Amazon would block this. Actually, Amazon is, I think that on one of the forums I already saw them or on the presentation that if you want to keep your uh, Lambda always warm, just ping it every nine minutes. That's the way to go. Actually, that's so common case that I had in my in the GitHub in the project I had such a such a issue opened. Others because I see it as a configuration SBT. Keep it warm or something like keep warm. And I would deploy CloudWatch that would send dummy message every nine minutes. That's it. Right? We would have it out of the box. Yeah. <laughs> I could. Uh, questions? No, I don't think so. Uh, maybe there are some workarounds for that, but I don't know. I'd, I, I'd say probably not at this point. Yeah, you could, but you would do DDoS every nine minutes. But you don't really have the, you know, you don't really have the power to define how many instances should be started. Yeah, so, oh, you could, but wouldn't you at yeah. the end end up in the same situation that you start to manage the infrastructure and own balancing, and that is the point that we were trying to solve. I mean, look, the thing is here, I think that the thing here is that it is not feasible for every solution, and in particular, I think like, uh, I mean, we are working for, uh, for Tesco, right? And uh, they have this e-commerce platform which have basically huge number of uh, customers worldwide, right? They, they handle many, many, uh, many countries. So this is, when we talk about the load that with the application with millions of customers, tens of thousands of uh, requests or even thousands of requests every second, I mean, there's so much involved at this point that most of these companies are creating their own serverless apps there, you know, uh, uh, at, uh, at in their infrastructure, right? Because what you do, you create Kubernetes, you do all those things related to that. And at the end of the day, from the development perspective, you would like to think about that, that I got my application, I want to deploy it something, I want to have this SLA, and I want to have the capacity bailing with scaling out, scaling down, and all those things. 
and I would like to have this ready in my company. So big companies like banks, like the like Tesco, like big uh, the e-commerce uh, companies, they do that in-house anyway. So I think we are talking in about some kind of a middle range, so small to middle range. If we think about like, I think that I, I worked in the Polish, uh, for Polish companies, uh, for, for Polish market like 10 years ago or something. And when I think about this, probably most of those traffic would be handled by the serverless. Right? So Poland is not the big, somebody will probably, some of the usages would need some specific, some specific things, but many of them could be handled by out of the box by these things. It's, it's like, you know, if something is out of the box, it's, it's something that you probably can, you need to agree to some things, right? And if you have really, really uh, uh, requirements that require really sophisticated things, then you are usually on your own anyway. But then you usually have some budget to do that. You don't necessarily need to have skills of developing. Is there any other questions? Thank you in that case.